data game. It's the data game. It's the data game. It's the data game. The data game. Hello, and welcome to the data game, the world's first, the world's best, the world's only data game show where anything could go wrong and usually does. I'm your host, Gavin Freegard, Special Advisor at the Open Data Institute, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our fourth episode as part of London Data Week. If you've not seen the data game before, lucky you. Over the next 30 minutes, you will not only witness a data-driven joust of jollity and jeopardy as two titans tussle toe-to-toe -to -toe over three rounds, you, our audience, will also get to take part, variously playing against our contestants, playing with them, even voting for them. Let's hope it's a closer contest than any other votes this week, and a more entertaining one than anything involving the England men's football team. So who's playing the data game this time round? Wits sharpened, fingers poised, hard-earned reputations inexplicably put on the line. Let's meet today's victims. Sorry, contestants. Miranda, who are you and what have you got to do with data? Uh, Gavin, thank you as ever um, for a, 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 an introduction that will stop us in our tracks. Um, um, who am I? I am Miranda Sharp. I'm an independent consultant and I work with a, a number of different bodies. Uh, but for the purposes of London Data Week, I am a, a former member of the Smart London Board and a current member of the Infrastructure Advisory Panel. Fantastic. Great to have you with us. And Stefan, who are you and what have you got to do with data? Morning, Gavin. Uh, so um, I am Stefan Webb. I'm a senior partner at TPX Impact, who do various uh, digital transformation projects with central local government and other public services. Um, what am I to do with London data? So uh, I'm a kind of mutant uh, who started my career at the Greater London Authority, interested in all things property development infrastructure, uh, where I uh, first got interested in data. Um, in fact, PTALS was my gateway drug into data. So public transport accessibility limits, I, uh, levels, sorry, I just thought were heat maps. Uh, someone then explained to me there's data and data science behind them, and that uh, led my journey into more more and more London data. Uh... Well, brilliant to have you with us. So much expertise, none of which will be relevant to most of the rounds today. Um, before we let battle commence, let's test your very special buzzers, which you've selected yourselves. Miranda, let's hear, hear yours first. What What is it? Um, the, I borrowed this from my lovely neighbour, Evie. Um, who is four, and I think it's a clam, and I've got a backup in case this one isn't loud enough. Excellent. Thank you very much. Stefan, let's hear your buzzer. It's, it's broken. It's broken. What, what was it supposed to be? It, it was just a standard internet issue buzzer from my phone. <laughs> <laughs> that was as good as it got. Well, not to worry, because we don't actually have a buzz around today anyway. Uh, <laughs> but it's nice to get a small window into your souls. Maybe you could use them to get my attention or as a cry for help. Without any additional further ado, let's start with round one. Yes, it's the numbers game. Three multiple choice questions about public attitudes towards data with more or less tenuous links with London and our contestants have to write down the correct answer. Simple, right? Well, as with data and life, it's a bit more complicated than that. If both contestants get the question right, they get only one point each. If only one of them gets the question right, that contestant gets two points. Our contestants might choose to compare notes and cooperate. Well, why would they do that? Well, it's because they're also playing against you, our audience, who will get one point if a majority of you vote for the right answer in the polls that you'll be able to find via the Slido link in the chat. Uh, when you open that link, make sure you select the polls tab at the top. If at the end of the round, you, our audience, have more points than the highest scoring contestant, both contestants will lose all their points for the round. 
Our contestants will have 45 seconds to, to confer and confirm their answers. Once I've read out the question and four options, audience, you might get slightly less time, so vote quickly using that link on Slido that you should find in the chat. Hopefully that will make sense because there's no time to go it through all it again anyway. Just try to give the right answer and you'll be fine. So let's start for a change with question one. Now, London Data Week brings some focus on local government use of data. Back in 2021, a poll asked people how comfortable or uncomfortable they would be with their local council using data in particular ways. So the question is, which of these four possible uses recorded the highest support with a combined score of very or quite comfortable of 68%? Was it A, to predict people's weight and susceptibility to health conditions and improve access to exercise classes? B, to predict air quality and traffic jams to reduce journey times or encourage people to take different modes of transport? C, to identify children who might be at risk of domestic violence and arrange for social workers to visit those families? Or D, to predict whether you or family members might need extra support from local services, for example, to help families with children under five be ready to start school. Now, I'm going to prepare my very sophisticated electronic chronological device, uh, a watch. So, contestants and audience, which use were people most comfortable with? Your 45 seconds, and contestants, you may confer, your 45 seconds start now. They're all horrid, right? <laughs> so I, I'm guessing we should only pick two right on. So I'm I'm, I'm going to collaborate with you, Miranda. So hooray! Uh, let's think of the two that we would differently pick. I'm I'm going. I'm for staring the... away from. The, I'm coming away from the children under five, and yeah. the. Uh, I thought we were going to keep the questions in front of us. And there was another one about health outcomes, wasn't it? That was B and E? So a, a is weight and health conditions. B is air quality and traffic jams. C, identifying children. D, well, extra so, so D, nobody's comfortable. B, the science is bonkers. And you've got five seconds left. I, I think air quality is all right because people know that Google track them anyway. So I'm going to Oh, is go, that C? Is that C? I'm going to go A, that's C. I'll go for B, you go for C. Okay. So excellent. We've got a C from Miranda and a B for Steph. And lovely to see some collaboration around data there. We love to see some of that. Uh, even though ultimately Stefan did screw you over there, Miranda, because B is the correct answer. So he gets two points uh, and you get zero. Uh, let's see what our audience went for on that one. Our audience also got it right. So they get a point uh, for going for air quality oh but the, the science of air quality is so poor oh makes me cross but as you were suggesting maybe a less controversial use than some of the others and um, it's worth saying so 68 percent of people were quite or very comfortable with that 20 percent were uncomfortable uh, option a which was the weight uh, susceptibility and exercise one 50 percent of people would have been comfortable with that but 36 percent were not that was the lowest net score in that survey option c which was at risk children was just one point behind air quality on 67 percent and option d on extra support wasn't far behind on 62%. I might get some reflections from you at the end of this round about what you think of some of those, but we're going to move on now to question two. London hosts some fine data-related institutions, as well as the Open Data Institute. That includes the Ada Lovelace Institute and the Alan Turing Institute, who in 2023 looked at attitudes towards artificial intelligence, for which data is, of course, the feedstock. So according to that research, which of these uses of AI was seen to be least beneficial, with 52% saying either it would be not very or not at all beneficial? A, driverless cars, B, autonomous weapons, C, assessing job eligibility, or D, targeted political advertising? Your 45 seconds starts now. I mean, that's surely the most useless is political targets and political advertising, but that's actually probably the easiest one to do. It depends what you mean by it says least beneficial, though. So, like automated AI weapons, <laughs> gee, unbeneficial <laughs> most of society, I'd argue, but they might be quite effective. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're looking at beneficial. Well, I'm having D, okay. you can, and, and you can win with B. 
No, are we, is our strategy, if I get all the points, we have collectively beaten the audience? That is very much our strategy. Very good. 10 wow. seconds. All right, let's go. All right, I'm going to have it written down in time now, a nice big... Okay, so you've gone for B, Stefan and Miranda, you've gone for D. So you've gone for your same split strategy. One of you was again correct. <laughs> this time it was Miranda. So two points to Miranda, none to Stefan, and also none to our audience oh, who yeah. went for autonomous weapons with a thumping 59%. That was not the right answer. Um, just to go through some of the other answers quickly. Um, so yeah, 52% of people thought political advertising was not beneficial, just ahead of targeted consumer advertising on 50%, which wasn't one of our options. Uh, it's also ahead of C, job el el eligibility on 47%, A, driverless cars on 45%, and way ahead of autonomous weapons on 29%. Assessing the risk of cancer was seen as the most beneficial use of AI, followed by facial recognition for border control, policing and unlocking phones in that order. Now, um, the audience score on that round means that, um, well, actually, they can still tie if you both get the next question wrong. So no pressure on our contestants there. Question three. A 2022 government survey asked the public how much they understood key terms and technologies like algorithms, cookies and deep fakes. But it also included a totally made up technology, neural turbines, to test if people were overclaiming how much they knew. So this is your question. Overall, 15% of people said yes, they did understand the term neural turbines. What percentage of Londoners said they understood the term? Was it A, 12%, B, 24%, C, 40%, or D, 51%? Audience, go to Slido. Contestants, your 45 seconds start now. So I know that men were overrepresented in the sample that said they knew this. <laughs> Uh, and, it, and, and, and Gavin has used this on an IFG data bytes before. And, and Londoners are naturally braggy anyway. Oh, okay. So, I think 51 is far too high. Yeah, it's 40 or 24, I'd say. Okay, you, you pick first then, right? I'm going to go, for, I'm going to go, I'm going to be consistent. I'm going to go for B again, 24. Yeah, I think C is a bit high. Can I have A? You can have A, yeah. Okay, yeah. thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs> You, you, you come to your answers early. Though. Oh, sorry. We, we, oh, um... Yeah, I mean, <laughs> ch chat amongst yourselves for a bit. Oh, okay. Five right, seconds, it's fine. Okay. Right, uh, let, let's see your answers since you've got... <laughs> so we've got Stefan going with B, and we've got Miranda going with A. Oh. So you thought Londoners were less arrogant, Miranda. Uh, you were wrong. Uh, Stefan is right. <laughs> uh, the correct answer was B, 24%, which is also what our audience uh, went for. I'm sure I could have dragged that out for some sort of tension, but actually there isn't any because Stefan finishes that round with four points and Miranda finishes that with two points. Uh, since you're wondering, and Miranda, you mentioned this, A, 12% was how many women said they knew the term versus 17% of men. 51% was the score for a group the survey described as optimistic tech dabblers, while 40% was the percentage of Londoners who understood, or said they understood, the term deepfake compared to 28% of the population overall. So, Stefan, Miranda, any reflections on that round? What, uh, what surprised you? What didn't surprise you? The first question really surprised me because the, the data is so weak in those areas to make those predictions that um, I, I, would be, I would be worried that anyone, if anyone said that they could do those things, I would be worried. And my first question would be, where do you get the data from? Great. I'm, I'm most enthused by the, the, the what was that last term, uh, amateur tech dabbler kind of thing. I, I, th I think that's me. I'm, I'm slightly worried. I feel quite seen by um, that category. Which begs the question, Stefan, what's a neural turbine? <laughs> uh, I'm sure people, given the uh, uh, interesting tech developed by people like Mr. Musk in terms of the Neuralink. Maybe people were thinking, oh, yes, surely Musk has done something like that as well. Uh, maybe it just makes your brain go faster with a turbine. 
great. I think you were right when you said that Londoners were more braggy. I thought that was that was very useful insight there. <laughs> Excellent. A really lovely takeaway for London Data Week. <laughs> Let's move on now to round two. Yes, it's only 60 seconds. The round that tests our contestants' ability to make things up on the spot and sound plausible, like they're some sort of large language model. The way we think and talk about data can dramatically shape how we use it. Metaphors matter. You may be familiar with data is the new oil, a dreadful metaphor, but a great concept for a round in a data-related game show. I'll ask each contestant to speak for just a minute about a data is the new X metaphor. They'll be allowed to keep going regardless of hesitation, repetition, or deviation. But after you, the audience, have heard both metaphors, you'll get to vote for the contestant you thought busked it best. And again, you'll be able to use the Slido link to do that once you've heard both of our contestants. So we're going to start with Miranda. Miranda, your metaphor is data is the new wine. Data is the new wine. Take a few moments to think about it. Remember, audience, you'll be voting for your favourite contestant once you've heard both. So data is the new wine. Miranda, your 60 seconds starts in five, four, Three, two, one, go. Thank you very much for the opportunity to talk about data being the new wine. Um, I, like wine, um, data has the opportunity and wine have the opportunity to be invested in. And in fact, they need to be invested in uh, because invariably uh, the place where the data is made, um, it, it is, it is um, in, in large supply and it requires investing in. And much of the, the investing in, in wine and data um, is unglamorous work um, and involves um, heavy lifting, I, I think. Um, I th I, wine is, um, is easy to imbibe um, and easy to get drunk on. So lots of people will enjoy um, a great deal of wine. Um, and certainly as they um, enjoy more of it, their appetite for it can increase. Um, and and um, their, their trust in it will increase, even though the quality might have decreased. Uh, so, uh, and um, data, data, of course, is, is like wine, is a global Time's phenomenon. Up, I'm afraid, Miranda. Time's up. Thank you it's very much. That's my stride there. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed for that. And I have to say a much more positive uh, metaphor than uh, some of you may have heard on the hit TV show Succession, where at one point the character Tom says, information, Greg, it's like a bottle of fine wine. You store it, you hoard it, you save it for a special occasion, and then you smash someone's face in with it. A great sentiment for all of us there. And I'm very glad you were much more positive, Miranda. So thank you very much for that. Uh, now it's your turn, Stefan. Your metaphor is data is the new oxygen. Data is the new oxygen. Again, take a few moments to think about it. Again, audience, go to Slido. You'll be voting for your favourite contestant in just over a minute's time. Stefan, data is the new oxygen. Your 60 seconds starts in five, four, three, two, one, go. Um, thank you for the opportunity to talk about how data is the new oxygen. Uh, obviously, this is a particularly terrible game for me as I talk far too fast usually. Uh, and actually, uh, I need lots of oxygen uh, to speak fast and lots of data uh, to tell me uh, what to say. Um, and, and one of the similarities between uh, oxygen uh, and data is uh, there's lots of hot air around both of them. Uh, and uh, we've all been up in the uh, um, data uh, air balloon uh, surveying the city of London and its vast uh, deposits of data and oxygen. Uh, and we've enjoyed uh, seeing uh, how much that data is used, but also how that data is polluted. We know uh, the problems of poor data standards, uh, in uninteroperable systems, uh, and we need to get rid of that pollution through rigorous uh, data standards uh, and a new Clean Air and Clean Data Act for London. And that was pretty much bang on time. Thank you very much, Stefan. Now, audience, you're going to have around 30 seconds to vote for your favourite, Miranda on wine or Stefan on oxygen. 
as it were. Uh, why you do that, uh, Stefan? What were your reflections on uh, on that round? Your metaphor and Miranda's. Uh, I, I I liked how Miranda. Isn't there a famous data saying like data? Uh, good data ages like wine, not like cheese or something. I, Technology I was... ages like fish. That's the fish. That's the one. That's the Lisa uh, Allen one. That one. Yeah, that's a that's a very good one. Surprised not to hear that. And uh, yeah. I should have brought in Miranda's uh, air quality data is is terrible, uh, or air quality modelling is terrible. Actually, from your earlier point. And Miranda, how did you find that? I thought I thought Stefan was fantastic, and his finish with the flourish of the Clean Air Act was you know, exemplary and fantastic. At one point, I thought you were going to go as far as the O2. <laughs> uh, and say that it's a bit like the OT. So uh, uh, yes, I, I I was I was blown away uh, by it. I, I would have used a lot of the um, metaphors for oil actually. So you can't do anything without it, um, and uh, you know necessary for so it's the fuel of business. I, I'm still cross that I didn't know that. I, I've never watched Traitors, so I didn't know the you, you put it in the in the bottle and smash someone's face with it. Yes, but uh, not to be recommended for those of you watching us at home, it must be said. Uh, now, the votes are in, and it's 50% each. So uh, everyone loved both of you, which is great. I'm going to, I mean, it's totally pointless, but I'll give you two points each. Why not? So that means that we go into the final round with Miranda on four points and Stefan on six points. So let's play round three. Yes, it's the generative game. It's nice to see you, to see you blank. Because this round isn't actually a ripoff of Bruce Forsyth's finest. Oh no, instead, I'll be channeling the great Terry Walker. And a game you might just recognize as a very modern take on blankety blank. Yes, I'm going to give our contestants a phrase. We've replaced a word with a blank. Our contestants will have 30 seconds maximum to write down a word they think should replace that blank. Then we'll see how many of our celebrity panel, don't get too excited, have written down the same word. Our contestants will get a point for each match they get. Stefan, Miranda, shall we meet our celebrities? Oh, yes. <laughs> are, yeah. you, are you excited even though you've seen the running order and you know exactly what's about to happen? I've forgotten the running order. Brilliant. That's what we like to hear. So let's meet our celebrities playing today. They are ChatGPT from OpenAI, Pi from Inflection AI, Claude from Anthropic, Gemini from Google, and Perplexity from Perplexity AI. And for the third and final question only, they'll be joined by you, the audience, from all over the place, literally, and by this point in proceedings, no doubt figuratively as well. Yes, instead of actual celebrities, we've asked five different generative AI tools to play along. You, our audience, will also get to vote on the third and final question only over on Slido. I bet you can hardly contain yourselves. But let's start. Or are we trying to be right? Well, this, this is entirely up to you. Do you want to be funny? Do you want to be what humans might think of as right? Or do you want to try to game what you think the generative AI tools might come up with? How exciting is this? So let's give you the first question. This is contestants and Gen AI only. William Tell found himself in the 21st century with his son. Instead of shooting an apple on the top of his head, he shot a blank. William Tell found himself in the 21st century with his son. Instead of shooting an apple on the top of his head, he shot a blank. Write down your answers now, contestants, and uh, let me know when you're finished. You've got a maximum of 30 seconds, but hopefully it won't take you that long. Shall we see what you went for, contestants? So William Tell found himself in the 21st century with his son. Instead of shooting an apple on the top of his head, he shot a what? Let's have a look. What did you go for? So we've got an iPhone from Stefan. And what have you got written down there on your post-it note, Miranda? A Mac. A Mac. So I, I really like that. Presumably, you were both going for an apple pun there which you knew I'd appreciate. Uh, <laughs> the question is, 
have the generative AI tools appreciated that? Let's see the answers from our gen AI tools. We had three of them go for drone. <laughs> Quite. And two of them went for smartphone. So I am going to give Stefan two points there. Now, um, I also asked those generative AI tools why they gave those answers. All of them went for drone or smartphone as quintessentially modern objects. I'm particularly intrigued by Gemini, which said that replacing the apple with a drone, quote, keeps the element of a small airborne object requiring precise archery, which raises several questions about 14th century Swiss apples. Uh, perplexity, meanwhile, notes that smartphones are ubiquitous devices that, quote, people, including children, constantly have with them or on their heads. <laughs> perplexity, indeed. Let's move to our second question. You're going to be filling in two blanks this time. Artificial intelligence is neither blank nor blank. AI is neither blank nor blank. Write your answers down now, Stefan and Miranda. Are you done? I can hear scribbling frantically, furiously, fourth wall breakingly. Let's see what you've got. So oh. we've got sentient and intelligent from Stefan and Miranda, what have you gone for? I was really tempted to do artificial and intelligent, but I said I did intelligent and intuitive. Interesting. Shall we see what, because I, I wondered if you might go for artificial nor intelligent, which, uh, for instance, Kate Crawford, the AI expert, says that that um, is made for natural resources and it's people who are performing the tasks to make the systems appear autonomous. What did our gen AI tools go for? Well, chat GPT went with human and infallible, high with perfect and sentient, Flawed with good and evil, perplexity also went with good and evil, and Gemini went with sentient and omnipotent. <laughs> so I think that gives us, I'll be generous and give half a point <laughs> to Stefan on that one. Uh, interesting common themes, I think, from the chat box there. Though I'm enjoying the contrast between chat GPT, which says AI isn't human, and Claude and Perplexity, which stress the role of humans in how the tools are used. So um, I would like to say there's something to play for here on the final question, but there isn't. So I'm just going to skip over that and bring our audience back in. Uh, our final question, question three, it's a two word phrase with one blank. The super intelligence match game, if you will. So audience, remember, you can go to the Slido link in the chat. We're going to give you several options. Please vote for your favorite. The final question is simply this. Data blank. And you want three words. You've got, you've got a free word. You can use any word you want. Data blank. Audience, do get involved on Slido. You should be able to vote for some options over there. I'm going to give you a few more moments, uh, a few more moments, a few more moments uh, in the audience to log your vote. The Slido should be open for your selections. Let's see. So, Stefan and Miranda, have you got answers written down? We're meant to have three. No, just one. Just one. Okay, I've written down three anyway. <laughs> choose, choose, choose your favourite. Okay. So, we're going to close, I think, the audience voting there. So, Stefan and Miranda, what did you have? Data blank. I had data people. Data people. I like that. I also had non nonsense and stuff. People, what? nonsense, and stuff. That's a great sort of title for an autobiography or, or something. I, I feel. And Stefan, what did you go for? Data R. 
Oh, referring to the long-standing, is it data is or data are? I, I, I like the references there. The question is, did the Gen AI go for any of those? Let's see the answers from the generative AI tools. And the short answer is no, none of them did. Mm. So uh, we had analysis, privacy, science, driven and mining. Whereas out of the options they went for, the audience went for data protection. So um, no points for anybody there. Well done. That's more in the spirit of the data game than actually getting things right, which you were doing uh, earlier on. So uh, before we wrap up and I give you the long awaited final scores, Miranda and Stefan, any reflections on your experience playing the data game today? What did you find most surprising? Did you enjoy it? Would you recommend us to a friend? Would you leave a positive review on Google, TripAdvisor, or wherever you listen to your podcasts? What did you think? It was quite scary. Um, I regret uh, recommending Stefan because then he roundly beat me on every round. Uh, but <laughs> I, did, I did enjoy collaborating with him. Uh, likewise, and uh, I, I, I was absolutely petrified for 60 seconds i can't i can't ever do that again that was that was quite horrific um uh, but also fun hopefully for others did you did you learn anything is there one thing that you would take away from today's experience in inverse some, some of the ai hallucinations were were quite yeah very surprising uh, and uh, being an optimistic tech dabbler uh, uh, that maybe um isn't surprising and miranda how about you uh, um, so, um, it was rubbish, wasn't it? So I, yes, I, it was, I liked seeing the difference between, um, the different models. Excellent. And again, other models are available other than the ones that were used. So after all that, a huge congratulation to today's winner, Stefan, by 14 and a half points to eight. Congratulations to Stefan. Huge commiserations to, well, both of you and everyone watching, frankly. Uh, Miranda and Stefan, thank you so much for playing the data game today. Everyone, thank you for joining us. I hope you enjoyed today's data game. I hope maybe you even learned something, thought about data differently, or were simply able to justify having half an hour not doing any work because it was vaguely work-related. Whether you did or didn't, just remember this. That's 30 minutes of our lives. We're never getting back. Goodbye. <laughs>